Hello and welcome to the Lunch and Learn series entitled Dealing with the New Deal. Brought to you without charge, sponsored by and as a community service of The Vital Nation. My name is Bill Whitty, Executive Director of The Vital Nation, and we're glad to have you with us. Let's begin. Today's webcast, Strategies and New Solutions, is one of four programs, three of which are available online, and we hope you get to see them all. Today in Chapter 2, we're going to take a look at the need for we the people to belong to and be active in a community if we are to thrive. To the extent that we share parallel priorities, we can agree to key goals that will shape our community. Thus we become, by charter or agreement, an affinity community, or as we call it, a purpose-driven community. There are all types and categories of communities which were all formed or which evolved to provide certain environmental and psychosocial benefits for those who joined them. We will examine the basic characteristics of community types and suggest a new type of community that will evolve to meet the new emerging needs. Our proposal for a new type not only solves new needs, but it can readily morph an existing community into a type which is purpose-driven, such as the PACE community. These are communities with a purpose and are held accountable for measurable community benefits. Residents in existing communities are not as mobile as they used to be if they own their own home. We will look at the impact that the crash of 08 had on homeowners and the psychometrics they are dealing with as they try to decide what types of communities and where will be in their best interest to live in the coming years. In order for all of us to make informed decisions, we need to have an idea as to what the future has in store for us. While nobody can foretell the future, there are demographic indicators that can provide us a basis of some key performance factors and markers that are fairly predictable to help us render better life choice decisions. The fastest growing segment of the U.S. population in the late aging population, many of whom live in affinity communities often associated with the now inappropriate word retirement, these communities have either evolved or have been developed, and the motive of their developer operators impacts financial health and sustainabilities of these communities, and we will examine them. The Vital Nation looks at the facts and then offers a new idea based on current and predictable future needs of our population. This new idea is called the Vital Life Community, one that is purpose-driven, which focuses on recreating new virtual family groups increasing the levels of socialization in an atmosphere of celebration, all the while promoting wellness in mind, body, and spirit. In 2008, the Vital Nation sponsored a symposium offering the postulate that we could reverse our aging process simply by a change of lifestyle if living within a purpose-driven wellness community. The key is to understand just what aging actually is, so that we will be eager to learn the techniques required to take better control of that which we call ourself or our life. And finally, if we can accomplish this feat, having better control of our lives regarding how and how fast we will age, that knowledge combined with new knowledge regarding the Vital Life Community Program that can be employed in any existing community will enable us to provide guidelines and protocols showing us how we can turn efficacy-based research, philosophy, and theory into a personal reality. And the good news is that there is one community that has been successfully operating for over a year in Ohio, a vital life community with applied research evolving into successful community implementation. We'll check them out. It's all about people. We are social animals, no matter how you analyze it. From the earliest times, we gravitated towards support groups or communities. A barn raising was a support group by community members facilitating a common benefit. As little children, we learned faster amongst other children, 
urging each other on, being mutual role models, and showing that we could do it by watching others. It's no different when we become older and mature. When young, we want our independence, and as we mature, we understand that success comes from interdependence. Yes, it's all about community. To reach specialized goals, we create purpose-driven communities. Let's next discuss the evolution and characteristics of different types of communities. Each of them evolved from a human causative or a market need. A Community Classification System Over the years, I've found this simple community organizational construct to be very useful. It was developed and created by the Association of Retirement Resorts International. I have been unable to find them on the Internet, and I assume they are now out of business or operating under a new name. But whether they still exist or not, it's still a very useful tool. And I will use it herein to examine the various characteristics of communities as we discuss the question, where will people live, especially as they begin late aging. Now the ARRI used four categories with four characteristics each. Their categories are unrestricted communities, planned communities, campus communities, and supportive communities. Their primary characteristics are identified as age-related, age-focused, the description, and the lifestyle focus. We're going to begin with Category 1. But first you will notice that each of these category cards have a left and right side. This allows us to compare the differences of the product within that discrete category. So let's start with number one, unrestricted communities. We have two areas, both regions and towns. The age focus for both is age inclusive. The description, one is areas with more than one town versus the individual town. And the lifestyle focus for both is ultra independent living. In category two planned communities we have two types age inclusive versus age exclusive that's their type and focus and the description is in one a development geared for retirees in the other age restricted primarily single family homes. The lifestyle focus for both is independent living usually located near area wide services. In Category 3, we have campus communities. There are two types, A, without supportive services, and B, with supportive services. Both are age exclusive. The description, A is housing developments with varied dwelling types, normally condos, apartments, duplexes, and so on, and often they have home health care services available. B also are housing developments, as like A, but they're primarily multi-dwelling oriented and they provide assisted living and or skilled care nursing facilities. The lifestyle focus is independent living with key services provided on campus. And then we have category four, supportive communities and there are two types, A, assisted living facilities and B, nursing facilities. Both are age exclusive primarily with some exceptions. The description on A is usually a single building with wings providing ADLs or various arrays of aids to daily living and B also usually a single building with wings or multiple floors but they provide basic care, ADLs, skilled care and they require some registered nursing on staff and other semi-professional staff and they do provide some subacute care which used to be available only in hospitals. Using this construct ARRI also created a self-qualifying questionnaire rubric chart and using this you can quickly self-categorize your needs and get an idea of the options that are generally available to you. If the question is is it exclusively devoted to assisted living or skilled care nursing and if the answer is yes then the optimum living choice might be living in supportive communities of some type. If the answer is no then this suggests that the decision is based on your preference of single family and not apartments. If the answer is yes, then plan communities that are age exclusively might be preferred. Or if the answer is no over to the right, then the suggested type is campus community without supportive services. And then finally, if the answer is no to the questions, is it exclusively devoted to assisted living or skilled care nursing? Is it age exclusive? 
50 plus years or older. Is it a municipality or more than one? If there's no to all of those questions, then the default recommendation is to go to live in an unrestricted community of some type. Of all of the eight options in the four community type categories, the latest option was one that was developed in the campus community type with supportive services, age exclusive with independent living. It was a response to the retirement desires and the needs of the greatest generation or the GIs and this is the CCRC or the Continuing Care Retirement Community. The CCRC is the preferred product as it reduces the degree of TT or transition trauma for people who select it. Others who will only move when they have to then have to move from their own home then again to an assisted living then again to a nursing home and this is usually a heartbreaking sequence moving from a location to another location each one of strangers engendering a feeling of helplessness and dread. The CCRC in contrast was designed to allow its residents to have access to the needed late-age services so they would not be dependent upon their children, yet experience a more active lifestyle as they aged in an active social context. The CCRC began in the 1960s, and since then the number has increased as the demand for continuing care services has increased, and today there are somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 of the various types of these communities. The key overriding benefit of the CCRC is the ability to enter while one is still relatively healthy and independent, thus capable of entering into the social community context and begin the development of extended family and new lifelong friends. The CCRC has been a great product for its time, but now it will struggle for market share. But the product will have to evolve because of two post-crash market-driven reasons. The first is the implosion of home values, many of which have either reduced equity value or have upside down value to debt scenarios, both situations making home sales in the now glutted housing market more difficult, taking away the traditional one-time tax-free home sale transfer mechanism from the consumer as an enabling financial retirement vehicle. The other reason is that the CCRC's business plans focus on expensive late life care as opposed to the more cost-effective prevention or health wealth conservation process, which is crucially important to the emerging boomer market that is now realizing a diminished retirement portfolio. Regarding aging adult products, currently there are two providers competing for a more limited age and income market sector. The for-profit developers who offer a real estate product featuring lifestyle and the traditional founding aging sector provider, the not-for-profit, which evolve from a care culture that focuses more on the care for the frail aging adult as well as the early service of subacute care. As an aside, traditionally, while the profits have garnered profit margins of 12% and up, many of the not-for-profits struggle to beat 2% and many are heavily in debt. Riding the leading edge of the age wave, the silent generation probably now has the larger retirement nest eggs of the next two generations, and the developers are looking hard at the past relative successes of the CCRC market to discover how they can lure more of those traditional customers away. And some believe they have found the secret. Home ownership, aging in place, all with a wider menu of service fees. Over the past 20 years, as the direction arrow indicates, the developers have been adding more and more services to their own products, taking away the exclusivity of some of the benefits of the traditional CCRCs. They're stopping just short of campuses with supportive services because they are loath to be involved in the care sector, which is antithetical to their real estate driven roots. Remember, the real estate developers are in it for the larger market share and higher profits. A traditional CCRC on average has 50 to 75 percent or more of its debt leverage to support the development of cottages and apartments, and many communities make very little money on them, even though they carry the greatest percentage of the debt burden. But the smart developer reduces his debt service burden and risk by selling the housing component and its risk to the consumer who, by the way, 
prefers equity ownership of their own home, especially now that they can fall back on its equity using reverse mortgages should their retirement funds not sustain their lifelong expenses. But the not-for-profits have not been asleep at the wheel either. Quite a few of their CCRCs offer extraordinary lifestyle, as well as exceptional mission-driven personal care. As the not-for-profit CCRC developers and operators have noticed some of the isolated incidents of spectacular financial results and market responses from the more savvy for-profit developers, the not-for-profits have, over the last 20 years, also been adding on the lifestyle components, including just not nicer housing, but wellness centers and multiple dining venues. Their products look more and more on the surface like the developers' products. But that is only on the surface and not always on the balance sheet. The battle for a better balance sheet for not-for-profits is not a lost cause. For the last 15 years in the conferences of the American Homes and Services for the Aging, or ASA, speaker after speaker has been pounding the mantra into the heads of the not-for-profit CFOs and CEOs, no margin, no mission. If you can't stay alive, you cannot deliver your mission. You can find equal quality physical plant properties on both sides of the profit street. Quality care generally, however, tends to be based upon the enrichment of revenues available. Obviously, the more well-heeled consumer, the better the potential for providing higher levels of service, enabling the hiring not only of good, but experienced staff. Well, so much for history. The question now is, what's next? Now for the surprise. The two major product competitors for the retirement or late aging dollars are the AARC and the towns. The active adult retirement community, the villages in Central Florida, has garnered a market share of around 70,000 plus, which is higher than even the resort-oriented century-old Sarasota with its population of 52,000 whereas the villages didn't even get started until 1980, when then it had only 800 units, and then it began its meteoric climb for dominance in the capture rate of market share. Clearly, the AARC product wins out regarding market share for the retirees. Will they and other AARCs, as we've discussed before, ever add the care component? Not likely. They're afraid of the pervasive, and ever-evolving regulatory laws and the unpredictable reimbursement schedules from the diminishing and troubled entitlement funds. What are we to learn from that? Aren't those very concerns the ones that are now haunting CCRCs? Didn't we discuss that fear in the beginning of this presentation as we looked at America's federal bleeding balance sheets? Do these facts spell the end of the CCRC? in favor of astute towns and AARCs? Well, not necessarily, because remember, CCRCs still are the only ones providing the smooth continuum through old age to life's end. To successfully chart and optimize the future of a CCRC, let's do a SWOT analysis of the CCRC, and from that we will see why the AARCs comparatively are doing so well and maybe we can learn how both model types can enhance their roles and attract more market share. It's all about market preference. We examined the three options for aging adults and in focus group sessions learned about the following issues. In traditional retirement communities like AARCs, the residents didn't want to think about the frail and failure period of their lives. They lived in repressed fear of that unknown time period. Whereas in CCRCs, we found that the residents were in terror of being told they had to downsize and go live on the other side of the door, the door to both assisted living and skilled care nursing facilities, especially when they had less real estate space for their furnishings and their pictures, and when they were no longer able to eat meals with their new late life friends. As a result, they did everything they could to hide their health decline from management for fear of losing their home, meaning their goals to stay put were antithetical to the institutional goals to put them where they were safe 
and in a non-liability status so that injury due to negligence of the care facility could be avoided. But moving the residents timely through the continuum was also a business requirement of a CCRC. This fact was borne out by one CFO telling me that their business plan depended upon at least 3.5 occupancies over the life of each independent living unit and receiving the new entry fees for each replacement resident. This is one reason that a late age restriction on who can enter the community is really beneficial to the community's financial plan. Or as another told me, I make no bones about it. We are all about sick care, not about health care. There's no money in that meaning prevention. We've talked about the historic community types and the relatively new community types geared for the retiring and late age wave. To review, we have the unrestricted communities, the planned communities, the campus communities, and the supportive communities. Now traditionally people aged in place at home often in the nurturing care of intergenerational family and friends. With the advent of explosive mobilization taking people to available new job locations, the family members one could usually count on were distant and often inaccessible. Hence the development of the campus communities, non-supportive such as the AARCs, and the supportive such as the CCRCs. Both offered new virtual support group formation options. Each have their contractual limitations, but both have been serving their discrete market sectors, historically, quite well. The question is, will they be able to sustain their business plans if the housing market stays stagnant with sales below their assumptive business plan basis? And the bigger question is, if not, what will they do? What's next? Or what's possible? A likely post-crash scenario is that the silent generation may be the last generation that ever considers the concept of retirement, let alone having the financial ability to do so. The boomers, on the other hand, will be inheriting massive debt and are now evolving away from the concept of the house with the yard in the suburbs and home ownership because of their unfortunate experience with the recent mortgage debacle. Renting now looks like the best option for them. This means that the boomer generation cannot count on their home equity as being a major part of their retirement portfolio enhanced by steady appreciation, certainly not if they have now become renters. So then you'll have 76 million baby boomers looking for products that now match their new life needs situations. Is it really possible for a brand to cover and nullify their competitors' threats? And doesn't adding to your speciality compromise your primary product vision? Let's see if that's the case with another consumer sector, convenience foods. All of these brands were Johnny-come-lately threats to the pioneer of fast food burgers, McDonald's. What did McDonald's do when threatened with others who offered not only burgers, but also new choices? Well, Mickey D covered and trumped their bids on each occasion and spread to new geographic markets. The brand and the franchise is still strong, but they had to do two things. Defend their market sector by matching the competition and making a better match and raising the ante with new products that the market had asked for, like salads and better coffee. Are there lessons to be learned here that we can apply to senior living products and services? As we discussed earlier when we mentioned the villages in Florida, it was no secret that active adult retirement communities have lured the greatest number of age and income qualified migrants. Their only shortcoming was their lack of guaranteeing late age care, the very thing that CCRCs are noted for. Now while the cultures are different, it has often been hypothesized that the ideal product would be the fusion of the best aspects of these two community types merging the hope of continued growth and personal control coupled with the increased life quality from wellness and prevention offered by the AARC along with the assurance of continual care once offered by the CCRC. I say once offered because most CCRCs no longer can offer the insurance but only the opportunity for continual care.
This brings us to the underlying thesis of this whole series of web programs, and that is the introduction of a new performance product called the Vitalife Community that embodies the best of the existing products while minimizing their shortcomings. This means revamping both of the current products so that both offer what the market needs. The AARC adds opportunities for continual care, and the CCRC offers home ownership and adds a preventative wellness program, and then you have much of the framework for the new product called a Vitalife Community. This is a performance-based program, outcome-oriented, which can be integrated into almost any real estate physiology and is highly dependent upon the attitude and accountability to residents with a high focus on the training, well-being, and development of all of the administrative and service staff toward the new wellness community. This now adds a new community type, Category 5, Vital Life Communities. While they are aged biased, they are not aged restricted, and they welcome the habitation of both parents and children in separate homes on the same campus. They also have embedded in their life plan a health wealth conservation program and concierge services so that the residents can choose from what they want, when they want it, or what they can afford. And most importantly, they can age in place, eliminating the dread of transition trauma. The ideal business plan offers fee simple home ownership with both on and off campus options. Since 2008, I have toured the country presenting the concept of the Vital Life community. Many developers have heard the story, recognized the benefits and advantages of the concept, and some were starting to embody bits and pieces of this program in 2008 prior to the crash. At least three major developers were considering the development of a greenfield Vital Life community and had strong community support, but the real estate crash put their development plans on hold. Now we are coming out of the post-crash with hopes of recovery. During this past three years, the CCRC specifically have been hurt, as their potential residents were loath to sell their major retirement asset, their home, at fire sale prices. It is anticipated that this condition will not be relieved any time soon. So the first priority is the recovery of the AARCs and CCRCs that are already in place and then focus on developing new communities as the market finally recovers to sustainable levels. Now back to the battleground for a huge but financially diminished market. Who will win the market share and if so why? Our two traditional players are the mission driven, not for profit, who gave us what their historic culture has inured versus the developer who tracks market trends and gives to the market what it craves and needs and, oh yes, I forgot the federal government, who doesn't necessarily build communities, but reimburses services creating an income market that can support various community types. Have we ever held our providers of goods and services in aging programs, not-for-profit or otherwise, accountable to a measured outcome? If not, why not? Governmental agencies inspect reimbursement-funded operations and provide a scorecard and the results are public record. But what about the people being served? Where is their periodic scorecard? And if there is one, why is it not made public, at least internally to the community of stakeholders? Well, there is one program that does this, and it's called PACE, P-A-C-E, or Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And we will get into the details of this very small but important sector in our next webinar. In fact, in that session, we will reveal our strategic plan to save America, transforming thousands of struggling communities into vital life communities, modeled after the PACE program, meaning that in a union between government and the private sector, like the PACE programs, we can remedy two of our most critical problems, the government's inability to render the entitlements that many Americans have to have, with the community type that will make trillions of health care dollars unnecessary because we will become a nation of responsibility through prevention. Better living in vital life communities. Let's briefly discuss this unique PACE program. We will highlight one of the pioneers, the Alexian brothers, whose facility we visited in Chattanooga, Tennessee.
We were incredibly impressed with them in their program operations. Eligibility requires an age of at least 55, living nearby, who must qualify by need and medical status. The goal is to reduce the medical costs of an individual by avoiding institutionalization and offering them a program out of their own domicile, but with a service center nearby that they can frequent as needed, wherein they receive a unique system of managed care. Broadly speaking, they have 300 subscribers per unit whose aggregated government and insurance entitlement benefits are managed for them by PACE. A wide variety of services are available at the PACE Center, which covers the broad range of needs of the aging population. There is also home health care, 24-hour on-call physician services, aids to daily living, and retrofit of the residents so a member can age in place at home. By and large, the individuals served must also be categorized as economically deprived and are beginning to show symptoms of frailty and failure, which is the life cycle for us all as we age. As I left them after a day's visit, I told my colleagues, they get better medical attention than we will ever get. I was genuinely impressed. The unique element, however, is that their reimbursement pool is packaged and fixed. If they are to make money, they must rely on early intercession and prevention. The first time ever, possibly, that a developer or caregiver has ever been rewarded for not only innovation and accountability, but prevention. It is our belief at the Vital Nation that the only way we can survive as a caring nation is to adopt a form of the PACE program for the middle class. If we are to have a chance with the discounted reimbursements that we will receive, if any. This will call for a true care reformation in America. Just as the Alexian brothers implemented and fulfilled the PACE vision, we must do the same for the rest of the country. It just so happens that the Vital Life community is unique in its structure of not only preventative and social approaches to life and vitality, but of its emphasis on transparency, mutual accountability, and measured prevention. That is why the PACE model so impresses us. Our new Vital Life model is one of reformation of the old care model. Our model of care is C-A-R-E, creating an adult renaissance experience, making late life the best of life affordably. Profiling the post-crash baby boomer. For the average family, their mainstay of life assets that will become the basis of their retirement or late age care capability lies with two components, their home and their 401k pension or retirement portfolios. Most couples struggle to even make it to the bare minimums required in order not to be dependent in their old age in case of sickness or worse loss of job income. So the crash of 08 was a crippling devastation to both the consumer and the private infrastructure that was gearing up to finally break even or even make a little off of the boomer age wave. But it was not to be. The impact on their choices and decision making was modified directly by the safety or losses of their key assets. The average loss after the crash was anywhere from 15 to 30 percent instantly due to the mortgage fiasco. And as the stock market plunged, so did the future fortunes of millions of consumers, to the tune of $200,000 on average for the upper 12 percent, and relatively heavy losses to those with less net worth and who were less sophisticated in investment. If you were the operator of a CCRC, that $200,000 loss, the equivalent of 80 months of payments at a CCRC, that's over six years of affordability. A couple would, if they didn't recoup that loss, possibly put off their enrollment into a community for five years or more, assuming that their house was paid for. For many home buyers, their dreams were shattered when they paid top dollar during the housing bubble. Not only will many not realize any equity from their homes at all, but they will have to raid what's left of their investment fund to buy their way out of their own home before the water rises too high. For so many, there is no incentive to even own a home anymore, much less sell their own home at a 20% discount. Think about it. If 50 to 80% of all diseases and chronic illnesses are preventable, and one could buy a home or rent in a wellness community that could exploit that statistic, 
and reduce their health care costs over a decade. They could recoup their so-called losses, even though they were paper losses. And having a position of scarcity in a unique community if you owned your own home would help increase its value on top of how inflation will increase its market value. And that's one more thing to think about. We will have inflation, and that will make the Carter years look tame. 20 to 30 percent inflation will be devastating to those on fixed reimbursements or income. But if they own their own home in a place of scarcity and of high value, it could be the best move they ever made. Let's take a brief look now at the next decade. Time now for Plan B? I'd say so, wouldn't you? You know, millionaires were made during the Depression, and some businesses flourished. But those who did were quick to embrace change and to ferociously pursue Plan B. What's the future we face ahead? It took almost 25 years to recover from the Depression. What about now? How long will it take us to recover this time? Well, if success in life is how well you pursue Plan B, then we have to know the rules of the road ahead. And we cannot get a beat on that with our heads in the ground or looking behind us. You can't drive very fast with a black windshield and trying to stay on the road using your rearview mirror. All you will see are the cars that are lined up behind you to pass you by. What six-year-old doesn't know about the four seasons of the year? It is a life cycle. Each season has a crucial function to fulfill as the cycle of life pursues its continuum. Why then are we surprised to experience continuing changes in our lives? The cycles of an average life go something like this. A child is born, goes to school, learns to ride a bike, plays youth sports, gets a learner's permit, then maybe a car, goes to high school, participates in high school activities, graduates, then possibly it's off to college. There's possibly a marriage, then maybe that first apartment is rented, and then we start the family building. And with each of these events, there are the related expenses of the life and of living. Once the parents are empty nesters, they may buy a second home, begin to travel abroad, begin to pay attention to their health, be more active with their grandchildren, begin to eat out more often, begin to strengthen their friends groups. They might begin lifelong learning, starting to have medical issues to begin and that will accrue, physical therapy occurs, ambulation diminishes, long-term medical care occurs, and then they have to deal with those end-of-life issues. These are the cycles of life. We review together the cycles of our own lives, each replete with a predictable measure of consumer spending. Now look below at the charts tracking consumer spending and the GDP or gross domestic product. Revealing, isn't it, how closely they are related? Maybe there is something to our life cycles and our spending that can help us predict our own seasons ahead. Harry Dent, in his seminal book, The Roaring Twenties, written in the late 1990s, explained his statistical analysis for predicting the economy and argued for its evidentiary integrity using the following chart. He compiled birth rate data, adjusted it for immigration, and then using that data created this chart you now see wiping across the screen in gray. He then overlaid the curve of the Dow Jones averages over the past 45 years, now painting in red. And as you can see he was uncannily accurate in his assumptions for the relationship, except for the dot-com bubble, which was an anomaly that no one could have forecast simply because that was what our nation was doing when it had a false sense of plenty and spent wildly on luxury items and went into debt like drunken sailors. Using this same concept later though, he extrapolated the data to forecast the future spending patterns related to future cohort birth rate statistics. Following the publishing of his book revealing his fairly accurate predictions, as you can see, the boomers were in their stride with their normal family formation and higher life earnings, and his predictions were again right on, as we see the predictable housing bubble as the result of the largest cohort generation in history, buying, upgrading, and even buying that house on the shore.
What is apparently obvious in looking at these charts is that the housing bubble was 10 times the size of the dot-com bubble. And we all remember the pain and suffering that we had with our dot-com bubble. So we can be assured that we're going to be in for a lot of pain and it will take a lot longer to recover, if we ever do, from that housing bubble. This chart illustrates a very crucial and disastrous mistake that our congressional leaders have made simply because they do not understand the nature of the free market economy combined with the refusal to desist from continuously trying to manage that economy so that their party can look good for the next election. The red dotted line indicates what the natural mean economic trend actually should be if untampered with based upon population. But the only way that we can recover and survive this next decade and therefore its economic trough is to either allow massive immigration or to become such a healthy nation to the extent that we can cut our pending health care liabilities by 80 percent. Using this graphic I'd like to illustrate the concern that I have about the massive development that was put in place near the crest of the housing bubble. There are probably thousands of developments, many of them aging adult oriented, that were designed and built and put into operation just before the crash occurred. This means that most of them had 25 to 35 year notes that were dependent upon a business plan which expects a continuous influx of cash flow for the next 25 to 35 years. What we see however in our chart is their debt vehicle illustrated by the black arrow which spans across the chasm of our economic plunge and it is highlighted by a red spot which represents approximately 8.5 years which relates to the very bottom of the economic trough. My concern is that sometime between 2012 and 2018 we may have massive failures in aging community products. Many of them are retirement communities, assisted living facilities, and skilled care nursing facilities. If Congress cannot cut spending enough to reinstate the economic basis upon which thousands of businesses and institutional enterprises had based their in-place 20 to 30 year business plans upon, and which millions of Americans have depended upon to secure their late age years, we will have collapses just when the aging Americans need them the most and when they will be the most financially vulnerable. Consideration. We do not want our communities leveraged to the hilt in the decade ahead. We need to finance only the secure money generators needed to make our community viable. This may be the second most important slide of any in this series. I asked Chris Keezer, a financial analyst formerly with BB&T, to give me an identical comparison between the average product used by not-for-profit institutional community developers versus the type of economic business plan and use by the traditional for-profit developers for the same retirement product. In this case, a continuing care retirement community, or as it is otherwise known as a CCRC. Now, without getting into the detail, we can see that the tax-exempt models have only half of the profit of the equity models. My experience, therefore, in this analysis leads to a recommendation for all future retirement communities, especially considering that 70 percent of the debt is for the housing sector, is that the debt burden for the community developing a new product be reduced by that 70 percent simply by selling the domiciliary portion of their community through a fee simple process. Not only will that reduce the amount of leveraged debt for the community developers, but it aligns with the consumer surveys in which approximately 85 percent of Americans say that they want to age in place in their own home. Consideration. If you can be debt free in three years, employ a program that will reverse the aging process and reduce the health care costs for the residents of your community, then wouldn't that be this next decade's premier product? The Vital Nation has the solution, but it's based upon this simple fact. 50 to 90 percent of our nation's disease and chronic illness can be eradicated. 50 to 90 percent of our nation's disease and chronic illness can be eradicated simply through a change in our lifestyle. 
Lifestyle changes can best be affected by living in smaller purpose-driven communities like CCRCs, AARCs, and ACCs. These purpose-driven communities can also be created by giving new direction and transforming naturally occurring retirement communities or NORCs into vital life communities or virtual vital life communities. In those communities we could even reverse the aging process. What? Just what does that mean reversing the aging process? In a seminal publication, Younger Next Year, A Guide to Living Like 50 Until You're 80 and Beyond, Chris Crowley and Henry S. D. Lodge, M.D., talk about turning back your biological clock. We will discuss this book, their research, and its contribution to the creation of the Vital Life Community Program when we next talk to you in Chapter 3. But today, suffice it to say, the Vital Life community position is simply that you don't grow old. You become old when you stop growing. Bringing our thoughts together in this session of Dealing with the New Deal, the unfunded health care entitlement systems will wreck America unless a multifaceted strategy is put into place now. A tsunami of pent-up health care needs and therefore claims are sweeping towards our meager safety net system, which is not prepared for the devastating onslaught which could wipe us out. We need time to get our act together and to allow the economy to recover and become viable again. The only way we can gain that time is to reverse the morbidity trend in the U.S. of people getting sicker, faster, becoming dependents and dropping out of America's productivity pool, threatening any possible prosperity for others in the future. We need to find a practical and enticing way to help every American to reverse their premature aging process and stay younger longer so that they can be productive longer, feel better about themselves, and enjoy a more fulfilling and vital life. How do we do this? We need to relearn how to grow. Can this really be done? Can you and I really live better, longer, without fad diets, pharmaceuticals, fancy exercise equipment, and without spending the money that we don't have? The answer is yes. Go on the internet and Google accumulation of changes of an organism over time. And you will find a dozen or more references, research sources and responses on aging, human lifespan, human evolution, and other related topics. Let's keep it simple and say that aging occurs at many levels within us as parts of us stop growing. So our goal if we are not growing is to revive that growth process again and send new signals to our body if it's not too late. We have all had practical experience of post intercession with our body parts. That concept is called physical therapy and it's based upon this fact. It's use it or lose it. So remember we age when we stop growing. In Centerville, Ohio, St. Leonard, a Franciscan community of 700 souls, became the first certified Vital Life community in America on May 31st, 2011. Tim Dressman, the CEO of St. Leonard, sent his wellness director, Deborah Stewart, to Atlanta in May of 2008 to attend the Reversing the Aging Process Symposium. This event was hosted by The Vital Nation and was sponsored by THW Design and BB&T, held at Stone Mountain, Georgia. Deborah joined 50-plus of the invited peer review dignitaries and specialists from the medical, senior living, developer, operator, hospital research and design industries to hear about the Vital Life Community concept, a purpose-driven community designed to reverse the aging process through better living holistically in mind, body, and spirit. 
For the event information, go to www.vitallifecommunity.info. This even launched a three-year quest with St. Leonard earning the rights to become the first beta Vital Life community, and after meeting stringent performance criteria, they were awarded full certification as the first certified Vital Life community in the United States. During the beta community orientation period, St. Leonard had to fulfill eight qualifying steps, initiating the Vital Life Wellness Program, which emphasized high social engagement involving eight of the Vital Life community human ecologies, constant communication with staff and residents who are all in the program is a must. Periodic feedback derived from satisfaction surveys meets the Vital Life stakeholders' accountability requirements, as does a blog site reporting to the world the events and progress of the St. Leonard program. Google St. Leonard blog for more information and data on this incredible community. And you might note that St. Leonard's feedback scores have increased from a community-wide 82% to a 95% as the program has progressed. Oh yes, I almost forgot. How much did St. Leonard have to pay for the Vital Life program, you might ask? Well, it was one dollar. Pretty good return on the money, wouldn't you say? Our mission in the Vital Nation is very purpose-driven, and that is to keep us in motion so that we can continue to grow. It is to help each and every person realize their ultimate potential simply and effectively using means and methods obtainable by every American. Using this chart, we see the four F's, or the life trend cycles of fun, function, frailty, and failure. And we see our age timeline at the top of the chart from age 40 to 90 plus. The red line painting across the screen represents the life quality metric that even those who live the longest might experience, what I call life without a purpose, humans just alive, passing their time on autopilot. The blue line, now painting across the chart, is a life with a vital purpose. How about saving America? And it is the line of potential that will represent a human that is truly being. What can really be telling about this chart is the cost of your life. As you progress from age 50 to 100, you naturally will have health declines and spend more and more time in the lower two zones of the chart, zones three and four respectively, which each will increase your cost of living due to increased health care costs. These costs could range from $50,000 to $175,000 per year or more. This means that from age 50 to age 90 plus, you have a million dollars at stake. How long will it take you to save up a million dollars? Being healthy begins to make sense now, doesn't it? For every day that you spend in the lower life trend areas of our chart, the cost of your health care will increase while the quality of your life will decrease. Our mission then, and the vital life flag if you will, would be the blue area filling in before you, which is your wellness potential. That can be yours if you are simply willing to say, I will. And for those of you who are in charge of towns, communities, retirement communities, YMCAs, or other community organizations, the Vital Life Community Overlay Program can bring new life and revenue into your endeavors because the results that every American wishes to achieve is a vital life with no strings attached and accountability from every person or organization that says, I can help you. To summarize this webcast of Chapter 2, in Segment 1 we discussed the need for people to belong to and be active in a community in order to thrive. In Segment 2 we examined existing community types, what their characteristics were, and we suggested a new type. Our new proposed community type will be held accountable to the public for performance, such as in the existing PACE communities. The crash of 08 virtually immobilized many of America's homeowners, and we examined their new needs and issues in Segment 4. Segment 5 gave us metrics that made sense, helping us to better understand what lies ahead for all Americans in the next decade. 
Retirement communities, as we discussed in Segment 7, offer differing outcomes to residents depending upon the operator type. In Segment 8, we shared the efficacy of the facts and the need that drove to the creation of the Vital Life Community Program. We only recently learned that we can reverse or slow down our aging process, but it takes knowledge and a program to do so. And finally, we discussed that knowledge and process are embedded in the fundamental precepts of the Vital Life Community Program, and it works. We briefly looked at the St. Leonard Community in Ohio, the nation's first certified Vital Life Community. Next time in Dealing with the New Deal, the Lunch and Learn series, we will examine the variety of new business model options available for us to consider as we try to navigate our way through these most challenging economic times ahead. This will all occur in a webinar format, allowing interaction so that the audience can ask questions and receive immediate answers. This session will be sponsored this time by THW Design the Vital Nation's primary benefactor and supporter. Let's review the solution-based content that you will see. In our Chapter 3 webinar entitled New Business Model Options, we will begin in Segment 1 where we will learn something by examining an Apple Core. In Segment 2, we will look at the new marketplace and learn that family matters. Then in the following segment, we will review our new rules for dealing with the New Deal. In segment four, we will talk about the need to revise current business plans. There are six developmental initiatives available to us all. These initiatives range from renovations of existing facilities for new markets, which we will discuss in segment six, which is a major industry need. Next, we'll discuss retrofitting existing legacy properties, which is an exciting new idea discussed in Segment 7. In Segment 8, we will talk about creating new products for new markets in order that we can be relevant. In Segment 9, the focus is on creating new programs for the new markets. These initiatives are key for sustainability. Can greenfield developments be viable today? In Segment 10, we will discuss this question. Disengaging from our existing business plan is a last resort option, but it merits examination. In 12, we will discuss the Vital Life community and learn why it has been so well received by the public. Is there a Vital Life community in real life? In segment 13, we will show you the first one certified in the United States in Ohio. We will discuss the international growth markets in segment 14. It should be in everyone's business planning. And in segment 15, we will summarize what we have learned in chapter 3, and then we will tell you about chapter 4, which is a follow-up hands-on seminar series in Atlanta focused on the details of all that we have discussed in the first three chapters, with the emphasis being on the implementation of each of the six developmental options. These options will be discussed with you in detail, and that's what we have in store for you in chapter 3 of the Lunch and Learn web series. But this will be a webinar that is interactive in that you will be able to participate by asking questions and receiving immediate answers live. To participate, go to www.vitalnation.org. Look in the upper right-hand corner of that web page and click on Info or Register to learn more or to sign up for the webinar. Hope you will join us then. This is Bill Woody saying, In every cloud there is a silver lining and we hope to review a few of those with you. Till then, so long.